can you talk about the painting behind you? Okay. Yeah. Um, that's, I have to say that that the painting behind me is, um, part of me. Um, my personal voice obviously is something that, uh, I feel is malleable. Um, like I, I know I love working a certain way, but I always want to be entertaining. Well, what if, what if I did this? Right. And so I was experimenting with another idea. It started, and I'm also like really inspired by Mark Bradford. And, and he was one of my two favorite artists that I posted about. And he said that he does not create any artwork from any material that doesn't come from Home Depot, <laughs> which I thought was really fun. So what I did was I, um, I created this big bin of papers that are, gosh, everything. I even, uh, this is kind of funny, but um, I've been tearing pages out of my old biochemistry book, my organic chemistry book. And it's kind of like anything that relates to my life goes into the underlayers. Okay. So this painting behind me, I think I have a, a video. Uh, yeah. The video that I'm, I keep talking about that I keep referencing is exactly what is behind me, but it's on a smaller scale. It's a 12 by 12. I cover the entire thing with basically junk papers. Okay. They're, they're papers that most people would have thrown away. In fact, I think I did throw away some stuff and I grabbed it out of my garbage and I threw it on my painting. Okay. So there's that. And there's just a mishmash of color. And then I covered the entire thing with one coat. Like I did here, I covered the entire thing with the um, high key white. But before I did that, I created a grid. So um, you can see there are areas like here. And here it's, it's an imperfect grid, but um, I put tape and I masked out various areas of this under layer of crazy stuff. And then I coated the whole thing with white paint. And then after that dried, I peeled the tape off and, and then I hit it with a sander and then I developed it. Um, so that's kind of my process here. Um, it, it features my love of shape, my love of kind of this graffiti thing. I'm, I'm really like loving Basquiat. I, I love his work so much, but obviously like I, it's not the graffiti itself. It's the fact that he incorporated his life into his work. That's what I love. And I love how he did it, right? I don't want to be him, but I want to take from him the fact his quote that I love is when I make art, I don't, I try not to think about art. I think about life. And I think that ties in so well with what we're doing. And I started to think about all of these things that became revealed, like book papers, if they came from a biochemistry book, or they came from an organic chemistry textbook that I threw in the garbage, um, or if it's from a Dr. Seuss book that I read as a child, or if it's from a math textbook or whatever it is, what happened with this painting is so cool because I kind of randomly taped off the grid, but I was kind of like, well, I, I like this and I like this, you know, a little bit. I didn't know if I would be able to save it, but when I peeled the tape off, they were like little windows into who I am and each little window is like, Hmm, well, I see this, maybe I see a word and it, it sparks an idea. And I start to draw on the painting itself it could be a poem. It could be an idea. It could be whatever. Right. So for me, this process opened up a new way to dip into my thought process, my memories, it was almost like jogging my memories. And I love that. And that has never happened before. So when I say I've been growing from the master classes, if it hadn't been for the master classes, I don't think this would have happened. Again, it is a grid and the, um, it has to do with masking out areas of your underpainting. This is the painting that I'm going to show you the video of where I had to save these circles and none of the circles are perfect because that's what I wanted, but I'm going to show you how to mask out whatever it is you want. So we can all be doing the same thing and have 500 different results. That's what's really cool. 500 personalities that all use the same concept. There is impossible for any of us to have a similar result. Part of that is um, the papers you select, the papers you prepare. I mean, if they're your favorite papers, they're not my favorite papers. And in that way, when you reveal these things, um, that's your story. It's not my story. And I think that is very, very cool. So that's what's coming. And that's why I'm excited because this is all about Everybody wants their personal voice. I have a feeling that everybody already has their personal voice. They just don't know the best way to present it, which is abstract composition or composition. 
And they also just don't know how to talk about it. Those two things. That's really what you're lacking. And when people say, I want to learn my personal voice, they don't need help learning how to paint. I think what they just need help with is featuring, you know, that's the thing about composition is that it forces you to think about, uh, make the choices about what to keep and what to let go, right? That's why I like it. More ways to celebrate. I chose some examples because it's not just the exhibitions and the magazine articles and, and the groups we get invited to join. What about this? I like working with the grid because it organizes and gives structure to my design. I'm learning what tools I like to use more and more with this exercise. That's what we want. Okay, that is success. Um, Andy Reno, discover your soul. Um, again, it doesn't matter what masterclass you reference, just please reference one of them. And it can be any one that we've done. So here's one from discover your soul. Recent studio work feels like me, right? It feels like me. I don't think there's anything more we, we can possibly want from our artwork. She says still some tweaking to do, but she, you know, glad that she posted that. Carol Williamson Wade, making the color mixing swatches is, um, is a small miracle. That's fantastic. Work in progress here. So simple to now choose a combination I've done to make a new one, to test which combos answer. What do I love, right? She's got her swatch here. She's got her painting here. And you can see the relationship between the swatch and the painting. I mean, that's literally what you can do is um, take, you know, if you have a swatch you love, just you, you have the colors written on there and you're not going to have to think about it. That part is not an experiment anymore. This one, Mary Knapp, she wrote one way to use the grid starting on a new canvas. Has anyone else recreated the grid image into a new composition? So I think this has to do with, does the grid come first? Does it come in the middle or does it come in the end? And the answer is all three. If any of you feel like you've had some moment in your studio where you discovered something you didn't know before, that's worth celebrating. And all you have to do if you post on Facebook is say, I'm celebrating. Say, I'm celebrating. I now see that I can create a whole world of color with just two colors plus black and white, or I'm celebrating, I now know, I love fine, delicate marks. I'm celebrating because I just discovered I gravitate toward less intense, saturated colors and love more muted, neutral tones. We're celebrating everything. It's not just about the big things. It's, it's all the steps along the way. Some studio work, so happy to see this. Lovely work by Cindy Lewis. Kate Word is getting ready for a big exhibition. Sheila whittam has been working very hard. So I just wanted to bring attention to those who are actually posting work and, and um, they're labeling it with, you know, what masterclass it most relates to. And then we have more work here on the grid. This shows you that a grid is a starting point. It's not an end point, it's the beginning. And then it's the beginning and there is no end to the many, many ways that you can use a grid. It can be so not perfect, like such an imperfect grid that you're not even sure it is a grid anymore, or it can be very, very precise like Rachel's in, in this case. And I love what she wrote here. She's like, my first time using abstract watercolor as an underpainting. And then she kind of went over it with this other, it looks to me like this mark making. And I don't know, Rachel, if you're there, if you want to talk about this. Yeah, I'm on the call. Can you talk about this? Is this is this a grid made of mark making paper that you superimposed over this? Yes. And then I I, I put I sealed it really well with um, medium and then uh, painted over that. So yeah, it was really fun. It was really fun. So if you're mm -hmm. trying to build your credibility, this is where taking risks and trying things that, you know, you're not really sure. I've never done this before. I'm not sure I like it or, you know, but then, you know, let's say you don't like the grid and you do this and you're like, well, what can I do to this now to make it so that I do like it? And then your next step where you put the masking tape on there. I've just never seen anything like it. You know, it really yeah. caught my attention. Yeah. Yeah. It was really fun. I liked, um, I love the grid. So like, that's like my cup of tea. Okay. Um, so it was really, it was, it was interesting to do, you know, take a watercolor painting that, you know, I just was mostly practicing watercolor, you know, that's what I was doing with that. And so it wasn't really a composition. I probably could have cut it down into a composition, but decided to just put that grid over it. And um, once I got the other paint on it, I felt like the mark making of the grid was too much. So then I changed it. I cut it up into a different 
into a different grid. I see. Isn't that amazing? So mm-hmm. your whole thing of deconstruction, construction, right? You're mm-hmm. continually trying to find what feels really good to you. And mm-hmm. again, that process doesn't ever, it doesn't have to end until you're really, really happy with it. So congratulations. Thank you. Um, Meg Gadam and Tina Von Busick and Jennifer Grace. Look at how different these grids are. You know, it's just, it's just an abstract composition. It's like your closet, you've got hangers, but you know, what you hang on the hangers can be completely different and how you divide your clothes in your closet and that kind of thing. When working in a series, you want us to be using the same size. And my question was why the same size? You know, it's, um, I, I look at series work is easier to feel the cohesion when one of the things that is common. So cohesion and series work means that you're you're working toward um, more things in common. Now you don't have to work in the same size for sure. But if size is one thing in your in your kind of your camp, right, you've got size, perhaps you've got a color palette that's consistent, it's going to feel more cohesive that way. You certainly do not have to, though. And the more advanced you are, I would say you could have a six by six, a 24 by 24. You know, again, you might just be using your palette as the unifier. 